Right now, Vice President Kamala Harris is in Mexico City for the second leg of her first big official foreign trip since taking office. The vice president already met with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Obrador telling reporters that he would discuss boosting security and the root causes of migration to the U.S. in the meeting. Today's visit comes after the vice president visited Guatemala on Monday, and there she issued a pretty blunt and clear message to migrants looking to make the dangerous journey to the U.S. border. Do not come, she said. The FBI teamed up with law enforcement around the world to take down hundreds of criminals. Tracking their phones was key to the three-year operation. CBS 46's anchor Karen Greer has the story. Police move in on a house in Australia arresting another suspect in a massive worldwide sting. Today, the Australian government, as part of a global operation, has struck a heavy blow against organized crime. Authorities took down more than 800 suspected criminals across Europe, Australia, New Zealand and the United States. We allege they are members of outlaw motorcycle gangs, Australian mafia, Asian crime syndicates and serious and organized crime groups. The FBI tricked suspects into using an app they secretly created and got into the hands of gang members around the globe. Phones loaded with the app could only be bought on the black market and allowed law enforcement to monitor criminals in real time. There is a robust network of international law enforcement agencies that are resolute in combating this global threat. Police worldwide seized $148 million in cash, hundreds of tons of cocaine, guns, luxury cars, and motorcycles. We have arrested the alleged kingmakers behind these crimes, prevented mass shootings. The FBI says the operation saved more than 100 lives. Karen Greer, CBS 46 News. Just got shot. I'm on West Wesley. 12, 11 West Wesley. Hurry, I just got shot. Panic and fear. Chilling 911 call seconds after a jogger was shot. Plus, a pregnant woman stabbed on a popular walking trail. A CEO in the hot seat. It was the hardest decision I've made in my 39 years in the energy industry. Lawmakers grilling the leader of the Colonial Pipeline. And Amazon rolling out new tech that's meant to improve smart devices, but it's taking Wi-Fi from your home to do it. But first, right now, breaking at 5 and a SWAT standoff in Sandy Springs has just ended with one man dead. We've been covering this story all afternoon. A live report from the scene just minutes away. outside for you. Beautiful, no, but we might have some nice weather coming in the near future. Our chief meteorologist Jennifer Valdez joining us now with a look at that. Jen. Yeah, I, I know pictures worth a thousand words. All you have to do is look at that picture and see that storms are on the way. They are now approaching the metro area. We do have some storms even south of the metro area right now in Meriwether County, Spalding County, and then we have this line that's about to cross I-20 starting in Carroll County into South Fulton County, heading into Henry County, Fayette County, Clayton County, and making its way through Fulton County as well. These are not severe, but they are producing heavy downpours and frequent lightning. So from Carrollton to, Ch to Chattahoochee Hills to Forest Park, we've got that rain and then east of the city from Rockdale County to Social Circle, seeing that rain extending into the metro area. These storms are moving incredibly slow. In fact, they've really slowed down and they're only moving at 15 miles an hour, so it's taking a lot longer to make their way to the metro area, but they are almost here arriving to East Point right now. The Atlanta downtown area at 525 Lawrenceville at around 6 o'clock, Dallas at 6.02, Marietta around 6.22. So much of the metro area is going to see this rain as these storms continue to lift north. Right now, heading north of Cartersville along I-75 in Bartow County, seeing some rain into Gilmer County as well. And that's going to continue for the next several hours. Even at 10 p.m., we're still seeing scattered rain with heavy downpours and lightning. Really, it's not until after midnight that that chance of rain does diminish, but then we have more rain in tomorrow's forecast. On top of that, it will be very hot with temperatures in the upper 80s. We have showers and storms with a high of 88 tomorrow in Atlanta. We do have an end in sight coming up. I'll let you know exactly what to expect tomorrow when the rain will arrive and when finally the rain will move out coming up. Thank you, Jan.
Let's go back to our breaking news now. Several hostages were just freed after a SWAT standoff in Sandy Springs. CBS 46's Zach Summers is live at the scene for us. Zach, this is a major development happening in just the last hour. Certainly, and police found the suspect dead inside a unit here at Area Morgan Falls. He was barricaded inside with those three hostages for close to three hours. Those hostages, though, were not hurt. Law enforcement have pretty much cleared the scene out here. But this all started around 1 o'clock this afternoon. We're told U.S. Marshals were serving a federal arrest warrant for a man who has yet to be identified when he started shooting at agents. None of the responding officers were hit, but it prompted a massive police and emergency response out here, even the evacuation of nearby apartments. Here's how one witness described what she saw and heard. Very stressful. I was scared. Um, so I was checking the news, trying to figure out what was going on. I called the police department. They told me to just stay inside and there's an active situation. Um, so I just stayed inside and checked the news. And then I came back outside and I heard more gunshots. So that was scary. Yeah, now crisis negotiators tried reasoning with the man to get him to surrender. But again, after a three hour standoff, they found him dead inside an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities have yet to say why the suspect was wanted, but we're learning. We're working rather to learn who that man was. We'll bring you that information once we know it. Live in Sandy Springs, Zach Summers, CBS 46 News. Thank you, Zach. New 911 calls revealing what happened in the seconds after a jogger was shot in Buckhead. And tonight that man is out of the hospital. He is recovering at home. CBS 46's Yasmina Austin is live in Buckhead tonight with those calls. And you can really hear the, the, the fear in his voice, Yasmina. Yeah, Rick, you certainly can. And it was after he was shot that Andrew Warhol immediately, of course, called 911. And he told dispatchers he had no idea why someone would drive past him and start shooting. I just got shot. I'm on Wes Wesley. The 12, 11 Wes Wesley. Hurry, I just got shot. The terrifying moments after Andrew Worrell was shot in his Buckhead neighborhood on West Wesley Road. In the newly released 911 calls, you can hear Worrell pleading for help after a man drove by firing bullets. Help! Help! Hello, caller. 1211 West Wesley. Is this a house apartment or a place to live? I'm on the street, 1211 West Wesley. I got shot. Worrell was one of three joggers who was shot at on Saturday morning. The other two were not injured. Now this man, 22-year-old Galen Newsom, is facing charges for the shootings. He's also accused of hitting a pedestrian with his car after police say he shot Worrell. Is the assailant still nearby? No, I don't know. He drove away. Worrell is back home recovering. His wife telling CBS 46 on Monday that she can't believe this has happened. It was a completely normal morning. It was 8.30 on a Saturday and in a very relatively safe party town, or as we thought. And the shooting was one of several incidents in Buckhead recently. Atlanta's police chief did address the crime yesterday. At the same time, a group is still pushing for Buckhead to break away from the city. Live in Buckhead, Yasmina Alston, CBS 46 News. Yasmina, thank you. Right now, health officials are scrambling to get more Americans vaccinated as a new COVID-19 variant starts to spread. The Delta variant originated in India, but now it's here in the U.S. and it's accounting for more than 6% of the cases. To get vaccinated, particularly if you've had your first dose, make sure you get that second dose. And for those who have been not vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. Health experts are especially concerned about states with low vaccination rates because the Delta variant could spread more rapidly in those areas. In a handful of states, mostly here in the South, fewer than half of adults have gotten at least one vaccine shot. Here in Georgia, 41% of people have had at least one dose, 34% have been fully vaccinated. Meantime, four states in New England have fully vaccinated at least half of their population, but the number of vaccinations nationwide remains less than 1 million per day, and that is down 77% from the peak of vaccine activity back in April. The numbers suggest the country will likely fall short of President Biden's goal of 70% of adults getting at least one dose by the 4th of July. Pfizer is a step closer to vaccinating young children. The company just started trials to include children under the age of 11. Testing will include children as young as six months old. 
Right now, Pfizer is authorized in the U.S. for children 12 and older. Meanwhile, Moderna says its COVID-19 vaccine will likely be available for children as young as five years old in the early fall. Okay. Atlanta police are investigating a deadly crash on I-285 just before the I-20 ramp, and it happened just before rush hour this morning. Police say a man died after crashing into the back of a tractor trailer. They're working to figure out what led up to the crash, but they say a can of alcohol was found inside the man's car. His identity has not been released at this time. New tonight, a large crowd gathering in downtown Atlanta. Dozens of religious leaders demanding equal voting rights outside of Georgia's capital. CBS 46's Brittany Edney is live tonight. And Brittany, this protest, it comes just months after lawmakers passed new voting laws that uh, SB 202. And these clergy members, they aren't letting up, are they? No, Tracy, they're not, and they say that next week they're going to be taking this fight to our nation's capital as they continue to push back at what they believe is blatant violation of voters' rights. We came because we understand that forward ever and backwards never. Across from the Georgia State Capitol. We know that we have an ear that's listening. Underneath dark storm clouds. But we want to make sure that that ear is not only listening, but that ear is connected to some feet and some hands and some voices that are continuing to walk out, speak out. Faith leaders from over a thousand Georgia churches unite to speak out against Georgia's new voting law. Some grandmother that's standing in line for six hours to vote to give her some water would be a misdemeanor. I mean, you know, just to think about this law and what it's what it does, it, it's a terrible bill. Would Georgia Democrats condemn as voter suppression? Their Republican counterparts label as the restoration of voter integrity. It wasn't any voter uh, mishandling. It was voters coming out and exercising their constitutional right to vote and casting their ballots that changed things in 2020. Fair, free elections. Faith leaders have called for the boycott of Home Depot, saying company officials haven't done enough to condemn new voting laws. And they're also criticizing state elected officials who backed the bill. The peach looks rotten if you don't let us vote. The peach got a scar on it if you stop us from getting to the poll. The peach looks like it will not go to the market if you don't let us pass our water. But Governor Kemp, get ready for peach cobbler because we will chop up the peace until Georgia is one nation with liberty and justice for all. And these faith leaders say that they are also pushing for the passage of the John R. Lewis Voting Right Act. Reporting live outside the state capitol, I'm Brittany Yedney, CBS 46 News. Thanks, Brittany. All new at five, a disturbing update to a violent attack of a pregnant woman walking with her child on a trail. Plus, hundreds of popular websites knocked offline, but experts say hackers didn't cause the outage. So what did? Also, could the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline have been avoided? The CEO in the hot seat, taking tough questions from lawmakers. CBS 46, winner of the regional Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence. Hey, Lisa. Two minutes. I hope she gets here. She's opening her door. Oh, she's opening her door. She's coming. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Doesn't help you much, but I'm here.
Welcome back. Right now, the search is on for a man who stabbed a pregnant woman on a popular walking trail. CBS 46's Haley Mason is live in Brookhaven. And Haley, you just learned that the trauma of that attack, it caused this mother to deliver her baby early. That's right. I've learned that this woman had to go into an early labor after she was attacked and stabbed multiple times right on this greenway in Brookhaven. Uh, that baby is in intensive care right now as police search for the man who did this. There are cameras throughout this area and police are asking for your help finding the possible stabber. Police want you to get a good look at this man. They say he is suspected of stabbing the woman that was five months pregnant multiple times as she walked with her three year old son here on the Peachtree Creek Greenway in Brookhaven. The mother is now in the hospital in serious conditions. Friends have set up a GoFundMe account to help her and her family. I'm told that she had to go deliver now that infant care. This all happened in broad daylight around 530 Sunday, Saturday afternoon. Police say the man in question uh, is between 20 and 30 years old, about five foot eight. He had tried to approach the victim and start a conversation. But when the woman walked away, police say that's when the man lunged from behind her and stabbed her multiple times in the back, sending her to the hospital. Because it's scary. Because you think that you're coming out here to have a good day, you know, to walk, get exercise, and it's, you just never know the people's true intentions. Certainly, this was an attack that took place uh, during broad daylight. There were several other people around. Uh, and that also gives us concern and is one of the reasons that we're so uh, uh, concerned. And it's one of the reasons we want to very quickly identify who this suspect is. Camera footage all over this area, and that's what leads police to believe this man was walking in the area prior to the attack along Corporate Boulevard and Buford Highway around 5 o'clock Saturday, and then on this trail just before 5.30. They're asking if anyone saw him during those times in this area to please contact police. The wording on that cap he had on said, dope. We'll have more on this story next hour. Reporting live in Brookhaven, Haley Mason, CBS 46 News. Haley, thank you. Right now, hundreds of websites and apps are coming back online after a worldwide outage that happened this morning. Maybe it affected you. Well, a major content delivery network called Fastly reported a widespread failure just before 6 a.m. The network helps improve load times for websites and provide services to sites and apps, including Amazon, Spotify and Hulu. Well, security experts don't believe hackers triggered this outage. If this was a major hack, we might see a diverse number of errors instead of this one clue. We are looking at a misconfiguration that is slowly resolving itself. Experts say today's trouble is concerning because it highlights just how major websites rely on big tech to distribute content and just how vulnerable our access really is. Well, new tonight, the city of Atlanta officially offering free rides to COVID-19 vaccines. They're trying to make it as easy as possible. City Council approved a measure from the mayor's vaccine equity agenda, and it allows MARTA to donate $40,000 round trip breeze cards to the city. The cards will be available through the United Way for anyone who is looking to get vaccinated. Developing right now, the western U.S. dealing with one of the worst drought seasons on record. In California, drought monitors show extreme conditions in 74% of the state. The water in Lake Oroville, the second largest reservoir in in California dropping so quickly, people say they can practically see it disappearing. You look out in the distance, you can see where the lake should be. One of the real differences um, with this drought versus other droughts is this is region wide. Uh, this drought is impacting the entire American West. And in fact, conditions are even, even more concerning in the Colorado River Basin, uh, which seven, seven states uh, rely on. In Utah, 95% of the state is in an extreme drought. Conditions so bad, the governor there asking people to pray for a miracle. I remember it wasn't that long ago when our own governor was saying pray for some rain because right. we had our own drought conditions here. 
Right now, today, much different story. We are tracking a chance of rain virtually every single day this yeah, week. Yeah, pretty much, and that's why we have no drought at all across North Georgia. Severe drought in the Carolinas, but for us in North Georgia, we're not even dry, and it's because of all the rain we've had and continue to see. Right now, showers and storms heading to Metro Atlanta. Not everyone getting rain, but those of you getting it, it's hitting you pretty hard. Right now in Carroll County, seeing some heavy downpours as the storms drift north toward towards Temple I-20 all the way from the Alabama border all the way into Rockdale County and Conyers is seeing very heavy rain and frequent lightning. The storms did split a bit, so we've got some stronger storms west of Atlanta, some stronger storms east of Atlanta, but then things have really calmed down as these storms make their way to the airport. We are starting to see some redevelopment inside the perimeter on the east wall here of 285 along I-20 to downtown Atlanta. So the Decatur area. We're not seeing any lightning and thunder, but certainly seeing some very heavy downpours just north of I-20. Then into Cab County, Stone Mountain seeing some heavy downpours there with even heavier rain moving through Rockdale County down into Social Circle. And then we've got even more on the way. These storms to our south from Hamilton to Thomaston, these are drifting north as well. So this is round one, but as you look to our south, we're not quite done yet. We have another round of showers and storms that is moving north that we will see later tonight. Night. It is very muggy and very warm. The rain did cool us down. We were in the 80s, so at least it's helping with something. Right now it's 79 in Atlanta now that the rain has moved through, but it is incredibly humid and it just feels really sticky and uncomfortable. Dew point still in the upper 60s, low 70s. That dew point going to stay around 70 for the next several days. For tonight, we will see showers and storms over the next hour or so. We'll get a break, then more storms possible later tonight. Staying very muggy and warm. We'll be in the 70s pretty much through the rest of the evening. Evening. Then tomorrow it will be even hotter than today. In fact, significantly hotter than today. We'll get up to 88 in Atlanta, 91 in Athens, and we will see another round of showers and storms, but mainly north and west of I-85. Waking up, most of us will be dry, although cloudy and humid. Then rain will start to develop. Most of the activity will be north and west of I-85. Could see some showers and storms south and east of that, but most of the action will be across northwestern Georgia with, again, heavy downpours and frequent lightning all possible. Higher rain chances Thursday, Friday. It's not until the weekend we see some improvement, about a 40% chance of rain on Saturday, only a 20% chance on Sunday. So it will get better. Highest rainfall totals in the mountains where we will see two to three inches between now and Friday. Next week, we're back to the 90s. Rain finally moves out as we start off next week. Until then, keep those umbrellas. I'm telling you that pattern remains all the way through the weekend. Thank you, Jen. Still ahead, it is day one for the Falcons mini camp and a star player, of course, is missing. Our Emily Gagnon is at the team's headquarters with how they plan to move forward without Julio Jones. Plus, an international crime bus lands hundreds of criminals in jail. How the FBI used a secret app to track down those suspects. Hi, I can hear you. One, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Okay, sounds good. You were cool with that full screen, right, that I put after the package? Okay, and I'm, I'm making it quick. It's only 10 seconds, and then I'll tag out. Thanks.
Well, now at five, mandatory mini camp started today in Flowery Ranch for the Falcons. It's time, though, to face a future without star receiver Julio Jones. Yes, of course, he was traded to the Titans on Sunday. So the team moves forward without him. Our Emily Gagnon joining us from team's headquarters with what it was like not seeing number 11 out there on the field must feel very strange for those guys wearing the red and black. Yeah, it was surreal for me, but I've got to say offensive lineman Chris Lindstrom, he said that he was thankful for the interactions he had with Julio. He went on to say that, you know what, he was a great teammate and role model in the locker room. New head coach Arthur Smith, he seems confident this team can go on without him, adding that he can't worry about players that he never coached. It's the end of an era in Flowery Branch. After 10 seasons in Atlanta, star receiver Julio Jones jetted to Tennessee. It's the first major move by the new regime. Rookie head coach Arthur Smith is still quiet about the situation. Wish him well in Tennessee, but my really main concern is our roster and getting us ready to go for this fall. So um, as for any player, you got to have contingency plans. You know, where, where your depth chart, uh, where your swing tackle. So you're constantly looking at the roster and, and you have a plan of what you think it'll look like. But like we always, all of us know in here, there's 100% injury rate in the NFL and you've got to be able to adapt. With Julio out, it's easy to assume Calvin Ridley will step up as the team's top receiver. But what about fourth overall pick, Kyle Pitts? He's listed at tight end, but could he be a hybrid type player? Line up at receiver? We feel like we got a lot of versatile pieces, whether that's Hayden, whether it's Kyle, whether it's Cordell Patterson, I mean, we got a lot of different guys and it'll be great competition in every room. So I've never looked at it like it's, uh, you know, fantasy football. Here's your 11 personnel, here's your 12. Like we, we try to mix and match and that's how we'll play. It'll take a while to fill the void left behind by number 11 on and off the field. But one thing is sure, with the end of an era, a new one begins. It's time to see what GM Terry Fontenot, Smith and Pitts have in store for the future of this organization. And Julio posted this message to fans on Instagram today, thanking them for their support. He said, quote, we'll never forget my time as an Atlanta Falcon, end quote. Now we do know that Julio will not be wearing number 11 in Tennessee. A.J. Brown, another receiver on the team, said that he tried to give it to Julio, but Julio said, mm -mm, he's not taking it. So perhaps he'll go back to the number eight that he wore at Alabama. We'll let you know, guys. All right, thanks very much, Emily. All right, Hawks fans, get ready for tonight. It is the team hoping to pull off a two-game lead over the number one seed Philadelphia 76ers. This is game two of the Eastern Conference semifinals in Philly. All eyes, of course, on Trey Young, who put up 35 points and had 10 assists in game one. All the action starts at 7.30 tonight. Well, ahead at 5.30, Colonial Pipeline CEO gets a grilling. How he's defending his decision to pay hackers more than $4 million. Plus, a former firefighter sacrificing his life to save others. How family and friends are remembering the man who died trying to save, save struggling swimmers. That's ahead.
We are following breaking news at 530. Hostages are safe after a deadly SWAT standoff in Sandy Springs. It all started after the U.S. Marshals Service tried to serve a federal arrest warrant. That's when the suspect started shooting at agents after three hours. Police found the suspect dead inside an apartment from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. No hostages or law enforcement were hurt in this incident. Now at 5.30, the CEO of Colonial Pipeline apologizing to lawmakers looking into the ransomware attack that forced the pipeline to shut down. Joseph Blount is in the hot seat today. As Senate committee, they grilled him on his decision to pay the ransom. Deborah Alfaron was there. Will be the, the head of Colonial Pipeline says paying a ransom to get control back of the company's computer system following last month's cyber attack was the hardest decision he's made in his career. We wanted to stay focused on getting the pipeline back up and running. I believe with all my heart, it was the right choice to make. The ransomware attack crippled one of the country's biggest gas pipelines and led to fuel shortages. CEO Joseph Blount testified hackers exploited a virtual private network that was not supposed to be in use. We are deeply sorry for the impact that this attack had. Some lawmakers questioned the wisdom of paying the Russian-based hackers known as DarkSide. The FBI and other federal agencies strongly discourage paying ransom because it incentivizes more people to become cyber criminals. Blount told senators Colonial was in the process of scheduling a cybersecurity review with the TSA when the pandemic and other issues got in the way. Do you regret not doing that in retrospect? Uh, Senator, anything that you could do is always helpful. Colonial CEO also testified that the company's quick and quiet collaboration with law enforcement may have helped the Justice Department get back a large chunk of that ransom money. Newly released court documents show investigators used digital fingerprints to track those funds to an online wallet for DarkSide. The FBI then obtained the wallet's private key to recover about $2.3 million. About $2 million has yet to be recovered. Deborah Alfaron, CBS News, Capitol Hill. And back here at home, police in Forest Park need your help tracking down a person of interest in a murder. Investigators say 28-year-old Del Mario Benton was shot a number of times at the Breckenridge Apartments on Old Dixie Road. He died from his injuries at the hospital. Police say the person on your screen might have information about what happened. If you know who this person is, take a close look now. Contact the Forest Park Police Department. An Augusta woman facing criminal charges after police say she buried her mother in the backyard. 43-year-old Melissa Lockhart is charged with concealing a death. Police were called to her home on suspicions of a fresh grave in the backyard. When deputies arrived, they found 67-year-old Miriam Lockhart buried. The suspect claims her mother died in bed and she didn't tell authorities because she didn't want an autopsy performed. Johns Creek has a new police chief. Mark Mitchells was chosen to be the city's top cop. Mitchell is a 28-year-old law enforcement veteran. He most recently served as the chief of staff for the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. He'll now oversee 79 police positions and a dozen civilian staff members. He'll be sworn in June 21st. Tonight, people remembering a former DeKalb County firefighter who died while saving swimmers from the Gulf of Mexico on Sunday night. Bill Smith, who recently served as a deputy with the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office in Alabama. The swimmers and the other deputies on scene all made it out alive. However, Smith was rushed to the emergency room where he was pronounced dead. He saw the need to put his life on the line to save somebody else's. And that's what he did. Even as a firefighter, Smith was recognized for his heroism. Back in 1999, he and his crew were praised for pulling a child and an adult from a burning home. Smith retired from DeKalb County Fire back in 2011 after 25 years of service. He was 57 years old. A new bipartisan report from the Senate says law enforcement should have been better prepared for the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. That report says Capitol Intelligence saw social media posts as far back as December about a plot to breach the Capitol, including maps of the building's tunnels and threats of violence against members of Congress. It also says the Capitol Police Forces Intelligence Division did not convey the full scope of known information to leadership, officers, or other law enforcement partners. Part of the reason it was overlooked is people were saying, well, this just can't happen. And, it, and mm -hmm. these groups of folks, they, they can't do that.
Now, the report mentions former President Trump's speech to his supporters the morning of January 6th, but it did not address specific root causes of the attack. A criminal crackdown across the world. The FBI teamed up with law enforcement from various countries to take down more than 800 suspected criminals across Europe, Australia, New Zealand and the U.S. The operation took three years. The FBI says it tricked suspects into using an app they secretly created. Phones loaded with the app could only be brought back, bought back on the black market and allowed law enforcement to monitor criminals in real time. We allege they are members of outlaw motorcycle gangs, Australian mafia, Asian crime syndicates and serious and organized crime groups. Police worldwide seized $148 million in cash, at least six tons of cocaine, guns, luxury cars and motorcycles. The FBI says the operation saved more than 100 lives. Stella had a world leader left stunned by a violent encounter. New video tonight showing the moment the president of France was slapped. Whew, there it goes by a stranger. Plus, Texas nurses walk off the job for refusing to get vaccinated. How the hospital is responding. And coming up later, as crowds return to the airport, the baggage claims are getting busy, but a new service wants to help you skip the line. We'll tell you how it works at 6. Here's what's coming up tonight on CBS 46 at 7. People in the Big Bang Theory at 8. NCIS at 9, FBI, then at 10, FBI Most Wanted. And of course, join us for everything you need to know before you go to bed on CBS 46 News at 11. Tonight's primetime lineup is brought to you by Beaver Toyota Coming. We're here to wow ya. Tonight's primetime lineup is brought to you. Tonight, new video out of France showing the moment a man slapped French President Emmanuel Macron in the face. You could see it coming up right there. Ooh. While the French President was greeting a crowd of people when it happened, the man shouted down with Macronia, then hit him on the left side of his face. Two bodyguards tackled the man in all. Two people were arrested. Wow. New tonight, a California couple charged with murder after a Horrifying road rage incident. 24 year old Marcus Ariz and 23 year old Winley are each being held on a million dollar bail and faced a judge today. She's accused of driving the car while he allegedly opened fire. 
The bullet killed six-year-old Aiden Leos, who was in the back seat. He was buried yesterday. A group of nurses in Texas walked off the job over a COVID-19 vaccine requirement. Dozens of workers are refusing to comply with a hospital mandate, which requires all employees to get the shot. One nurse is filing a lawsuit against the hospital and 200 other employees have signed on to sue as well. I'm not willing to risk my life to save my job, but I do love what I do. I love Houston Methodist, and it's unfortunate that they're willing to let us go over something like this instead of giving us more time. Now, Houston Methodist is standing firm on its policy, saying almost 100 percent of its 26,000 employees are complying and getting their vaccine. The Minneapolis crews have once again tried to reopen George Floyd Square. It is the second attempt in less than one week. Workers tried to reopen the intersection last week, but as soon as they finished, protesters began parking cars and piling pallets into the street. The intersection has been a primary gathering place for grief and protest since Floyd was killed there by a police officer. Still ahead at five, a terrifying tornado caught on camera. We'll show you the firsthand look at the damage done in Colorado. These are the Froys, and these are the folks at Genesis Elevator who have decided to donate an elevator for their son, Tanner. If you haven't been following the story, it's one you've got to see. I'm Better Call Harry. That story's coming up. Scattered showers and storms continue to move through North Georgia. We're seeing some heavy downpours and frequent lightning. I'll pinpoint how long we'll see this rain and more rain in tomorrow's forecast after the break. Today's Better Call Harry is about a life-changing event for a Woodstock family. A business in Marietta says it will build and install an elevator for the couple's severely disabled son. After seeing Harry's story about their nightmare experience with another elevator company, Genesis Elevator says it will finish the job for free. Well, this morning, the owners gave the news in person. At Genesis Elevator Company in Marietta, there is light at the end of this three-story shaft. You're honoring us by allowing us to show you some love. 
That's the owner, Jay Arnson, telling an emotional Courtney and Brian Froy that their days of carrying their son Tanner up and down three flights of stairs is over. Genesis will finish what Remy Home Elevators did not. So this is our hole. It's been two years since the Froys raised thousands of dollars and invested thousands of their own to install an elevator. Six months into the job, the Froys found out Remy's recommended contractor made the elevator shaft about a foot too small. Tanner's chair wouldn't fit. He built the specs of the shaft, which were the specs of the elevator. That's my bunny. His Tanner suffers from a rare disorder called CDKL5. He can't talk or walk or speak, and he has seizures every day. At 72 pounds, an elevator is a necessity. When, when Stu shared with me your story, I felt God speak to me and say, we're in. What does it take? We've got we to help this family. With this, size, with this size cab, would that accommodate? Absolutely. Yeah. That's Genesis co-owner Stuart Smith, who gave the Froys their first look at what their new elevator will be. Now that they've seen it, they believe it. We're, we're really thrilled that it's finally happening and there's good people out there and this is obviously a great, great company and we're, we're just really grateful. The folks at Genesis say they're not wasting any time. They're starting on this project now and they expect it to be done in about two months. In Marietta, I'm Better Call Harry, CBS 46 News.